Lifting Up Jesus, opening his word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, United States, and throughout the world. You're watching L'Oreal TV. Hi, this is Tim Worth from Morial TV and Morial Radio, here live in England with James Jacob Prash. Jacob, one of the believers had the question, is why is the lack of visions and divinations considered a punishment? And that's in Micah 3.6. There are three aspects of this. But first of all, we have to remember that Micah, Mikah Hanavi, its name is similar to the name Michael in Hebrew, Mikah, like unto Yahweh prophesied for his own time for the first coming of Christ, as we see in Micah chapter 5, where he predicts that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem, but he also prophesies eschatologically for the last days. Speaking of his own time, he uses his own time as a foreshadowing of what's going to happen at the end of the age. Let's take particular notice of what is happening here. One, they were prophesying in verse 5 of false peace. Paul warns about this in the New Testament, and also we are warned about it by Jeremiah. In the last days, it is going to be like before the Babylonian captivity. They will say, peace, peace, but there is no peace. Paul says, men will say, peace and security, then the end will come. The world will go into a political, economic, and uh, strategic chaos. Well, people are going to be terrified, quite possibly of nuclear holocaust or a maelstrom of something of that nature, possibly nuclear terrorism, all these prospects or, or possibilities that are already on the horizon. But we know there's going to be an absolute avalanche of events that are going to terrify people to the point where they'll look for anybody or anything that will bring a sense of peace and security. Well, we know the Antichrist will bring a false peace. Now, the epicenter of most of this, but not all of it, but most of it, will be the Middle East and will concern Israel and the nations surrounding it. There will be a false peace. Well, there is a foreshadowing of that <clears throat> that Micah speaks of. They cry peace. Secondly, as we see in the Olivet Discourse that Jesus warned about in Matthew 24 and so forth, there is also an avalanche of false prophets making false prophecies. They were engaging in occult practices that were essentially divination. I've warned many times that much of what is falsely called prophecy today is actually clairvoyance. It is not biblical prophecy. This is not to deny the biblical gift of prophecy. It's just to say that so much of what we see going on in the church today is not scriptural. We see crazy people promoted by people like Mike Bickle, the Kansas City false prophets, Paul Cain, an alcoholic homosexual, and people like this where they promoted, or people like like Gerald Coates and Mike Bickle who made these false prophecies and false predictions in the Lord's name, as have Benny Hinn and so forth. Well, there's going to be an explosion of false prophets in the last days, once again, that will be in the character of what Micah was talking about. Now, we have to understand something about Micah. Micah was a contemporary of Isaiah. He was a pre-captivity prophet, but he was a local prophet. His message was for the nation, but he prophesied in a region called the Shvilah, the Shvilah, which lied between the coastal plain of Sharon, that is the area on the uh, eastern shore of the Mediterranean, and the hills of Judah. So in between the hills of Judah and the coastal plain of Sharon is this area called Shvilah, the Shvilah. It's where the Maccabees came from. And in the lower Shvilah is where the saga of Samson took place. Very important place in, in, in scriptural history. Micah is a local speaking in the Shvilah, contemporary with Isaiah. In a sense, we can take the prophecies of my, Isaiah for his own time. That is the events leading up to the Babylonian captivity uh, that would eventually come in uh, 
585 BC, Micah condenses these and presents them in a local way. It might be like Isaiah was writing for a national daily newspaper while Micah was writing the same kind of things for a local town newspaper to make a broad analogy. So Micah is prophesying for his own time, for the first coming of Jesus, and for the return of Jesus, just as most of the Hebrew, in fact, all of the Hebrew prophets did the same. Now we have to understand the eschatological dimension. In verse 6, it'll be night for you, darkness. We've explained many times that night is a metaphor for what is going to happen during the 70th week of Daniel. Watchman, watchman, how far is the night? Is he coming in the second watch of the night or the third? And the Song of Solomon, the bridegroom comes for the bride in the night. Matthew 25, the bridegroom comes for the bride in the night. He's coming like a thief in the night. Work while you have the light. Night will come, no man can work. He's alluding to this great period of spiritual darkness that was prefigured by what was happening in the days of Isaiah, Jeremiah, and ultimately Ezekiel. Well, let's look at verse uh, 6. It'll be a day of darkness without divination. The sun will go down on the prophets, and the day will become dark over them. The seers will be ashamed, and the diviners will be embarrassed. The people were allowing false prophets to prophesy falsely, and then you go back and listen to them. We see the same thing today. By any biblical standard of definition, we can absolutely prove Mike Bickle has been a false prophet. The Word of God commands we don't pay attention to people like you. We can absolutely prove Paul Cain was a false prophet. We can absolutely prove Gerald Coates in England or Benny Hinn are false prophets. We can prove Cindy Jacobs is a false prophetess based on what she did in um, Zimbabwe. Uh, it was unbelievable. But we can prove these people are false prophets. A time is going to come once again when these false prophets are going to be not only exposed as false prophets, but they're going to be held accountable for their false prophecies, and they're going to be openly humiliated for it. Additionally, what's going to happen is not only will there be a humiliation for these people who are divining or who are diviners pretending to be prophets, but something else is going to happen. Things are going to become so dark that when people begin seeking an answer from the real God, they'll get no answer. Those who follow these false prophets will get no answer. We are warned in the scripture a time will come when men will seek God desperately and not find him. Now this certainly applies to the unsaved. Now is the appointed time. Today is the day of salvation. A time is going to come where people will desperately seek God and not find him. But the people who follow false prophets are going to need to hear from the Lord, and they won't. But let's continue reading this. Indeed, they will cover their mouths because there's no answer from God. But it doesn't end there. Look at verse 8. On the other hand, I, that is Micah, am filled with power, with the Spirit of the Lord, and with justice and courage to make known to Jacob his rebellious act, even to Israel, his sin. Jacob is always an ethnocentric term for Israel and the Jews. It has a specific meaning for Israel. In any event, it is also a general truth. What we see is as follows. A darkness will come. The false prophets will be exposed and humiliated. Those who've been listening to them will desperately seek an answer or a word from God and will not find it in the ways they've normally sought to find it. But there will be true spokesmen for the Lord. These true spokesmen, however, will be very much in the character of Micah. And in the character of Micah, these true spokesmen will point out the sin of the people 
and say, you follow false prophets. This is the reason you're not hearing from the Lord. You didn't follow him on the basis of his word. You listened to these diviners, these clairvoyants. True prophets always speak in accordance with scripture. You followed these diviners and clairvoyants. Now God's not speaking to you. That will be the message of the true people of God, the faithful messengers who the Lord will raise up at such a time. They will point to the sin of God's people. But as with Micah, it will not be a popular message. Nonetheless, it will certainly be a true message, and it will be the message that ultimately prevails. That is the reason. Now, there is a final reason. When you have counterfeits of the gifts of the Spirit, when you have gibberish pretending to be tongues, when you have clairvoyance pretending to be prophecy, when you have this kind of insanity taking place as we see today, and this nonsense has come from places like Pensacola, Florida, and from Toronto, and all these deceptions and, and counterfeit revivals, when you see this, these things happening, the Lord stops giving prophetic revelation because he doesn't want the true to be associated with the false. He just stops it. He stops charismatic activity until such time as his people return to him on the basis of his word. He may be speaking to individuals prophetically. He may be speaking to small groups of faithful people prophetically, but he's not speaking to the nation or as it were, to the church at large anymore that way, because they're unable to receive it. Until they repent and return to a biblical perspective, until they confess that they've been listening to false prophets, they can't possibly receive true prophecy. They have no way to discern it or to judge it or to know how to apply it. This is not to say that the gifts end permanently. And this is not to say there are not instances among the faithful remnant where the true gifts are being manifested. But that's what it will be among the faithful remnant. God will not speak that way broadly. You just look at what's happened with these counterfeit revivals and these false teachers and deceivers who are telling us that Toronto and Pensacola and Lakeland, Florida and these other fiascos that ended in splits and in scandals and God, even immorality. Um, what what became of it? <laughs> well, nothing. Nothing became of it. God's not speaking to those people in that way anymore. The prophecies that God will give now are to individuals, and they will be largely focused on telling the people, you followed false prophets. You went into divination, the occult. You went into New Age belief. You went into sorcery. You went into these terrible things, clairvoyance, thinking it was charismata, thinking it was the gifts of the Spirit, thinking it was a manifestation of the Holy Spirit, but it wasn't. It was divination. <clears throat> That's the message. But the people won't want to hear it. Nonetheless, it remains the message. Now, Jacob, uh, moving up to Micah 4.2, staying in the same book, in the last days, will everyone need to go to Jerusalem to worship God? Many nations will come and say, Come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us about his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. From Zion will go forth the law, and the Torah will go forth from Zion, even the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. This refers to the millennial reign of Christ. It corresponds to Zechariah chapter 14. The nations will mandatorily come and worship Jesus and learn from him during the Feast of Tabernacles in the millennial reign of Christ in Zechariah 14. It is the same meaning as Zechariah 14, essentially. It, or it, it refers to Zechariah 14. They're both pointing to the same thing. Yes, the nations will come to Jerusalem. We also see the prophecy of what's going to happen to the nations in the Middle East, even Assyria and Egypt, coming together with Israel to worship the Lord 
in Isaiah chapter 19 as another chapter speaking broadly of the same thing as Zechariah 14 and as Micah chapter 4. And in the same chapter, uh, Jacob, what does it mean to be a daughter of Zion? A daughter of Zion, a Zion, a Zion, was literally a, a young woman who was born in Jerusalem, and they were considered to be particularly desirable as wives. Often the engagement or betrothal taking place at Passover time, a Batzion. But Batzion became a metaphor, a metaphor for the Old Testament equivalent of the Bride of Christ, the Old Testament equivalent of the Bride of Christ, uh, daughter of Zion. We can figuratively apply it to the church, but it had a specific meaning for Israel and the Jews. Okay? It is essentially a, it has a bridal connotation to it. It has a nuptial connotation to it, not in the sense of only human marriage, but in the sense of Israel being Yahweh's woman as the church is the bride of Christ. That is the total imagery of Batzion. Roni, Roni, Batzion. Hariu Israel, There are many Hebrew choruses and things like this celebrating the imagery of the daughter of Zion. Okay, thank you, Jacob.